Good morning and welcome to the 36th annual Martin Luther King Jr. celebration, virtually. I'm Trey McGuire, Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement and MLK Steering Committee Co-Chair. I am honored to serve as your host for this morning's virtual MLK celebration kickoff, featuring members of our renowned forensics team. This year marks the 54th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, which occurred on April 4, 1968. 19 years after Dr. King's assassination, the United States observed the first national holiday honoring his life and legacy on Monday, January 20th, 1986. It is also the day that Eastern Michigan University hosted its first MLK celebration under the leadership of the late President John Porter. So on this day, we commemorate the anniversary of this historic celebration. Our 2022 MLK celebration theme of rising up for justice captures the essence of the ongoing nature of our work and underscores the need to continue to address social injustices in an honest and thought provoking way. Without further ado, please give a virtual welcome to our first performance by Cedric Charles. Cedric is a sophomore from Palm Beach, Florida, majoring in political science. He currently serves as the Speaker of the Senate for EMU Student Government, a writer for Eastern Echo, a member of the Honors College, and a member of the Black Honors Student Organization. Cedric will be performing a collection of literature focused on reclaiming water in the Black community. Please welcome Cedric Charles. There is a lake here with black bodies paving ocean floors like drowning family trees. This <laughs> is why they say waves taste like tears. So when I tell people I'm a surfer, ugh, I often get that, you know, that same puzzled look. Is this a joke? I mean, to some ears, this must sound like a, a devout atheist or unbiased opinion, but, but this is no oxymoron. <laughs> Guess some people don't know this, but Black people are a water people. You could say we were born on the ocean, but the elders, uh, 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 they forbid us from going in too deep to giggle, to splash in the water but bit us from riding the wave for fear that we would be a, a mass of blackness to be swept by the tide and never to return. And so I had always avoided that bridge, but, but, but knowing now the awesome power of memory, uh, how I forgot but did not forget, the road beneath the wheels disappeared and the whole of the bridge fell away and for a moment, I felt myself back there again floating. And even as I tell you this now, I feel it again in the icy bite of that water rushing into me, in that particular burning agony that only comes to the drowning, the question became, why do Blacks possess the fear of water? I heard during slave time, they leaped with crazy laughter to the waiting shocks, sang as they went under, drowning, In their 2018 dissertation, Jumping Overboard, Dr. Robert L. Stevenson Jr. examined the history of suicide amongst West Africans captured during the slave trade. As his study explains to many West Africans, the act of jumping overboard was not only an act of resistance, but a belief that the water would carry them back home. The spiritual connection between African Americans and water is one of rebirth, awakening, and liberation. However, history has stripped us away from our one sacred connection to the water, from, the slave, from slavery to the civil rights movement to Katrina and Flint and beyond. Water has been used to, has been weaponized to strike fear into our community, keeping us away from our ancestors who once weighed in the water. Turn to the poetry, Waters by the Washington DC Slam Team. There's a lake here by Clint Smith, Water Bird by Yasmin Bolden, Water by Portia O, The Pros, The Water Dancer by Ta-Nehisi Coates and articles from the Washington Post and medium. 
not a program, but a baptism in the precious gift that prepares us to walk in the newness of life. Wading in the water are the bones of our sons and daughters. On high tide, skeletons skate onto shore. As young, we're taught the rules. Run when it rains. Cover your head. Black bodies have always known struggle when it comes to water. A cold, steady rain fell as I drove the chase. I could hear Maynard in the back with all of his games. I pulled at the race immediately, but it was too late. We barreled through. Black people were once a welcome sight. Uh, with slaves bringing skills like swimming and diving to the Americas. You know, most whites, even sailors, couldn't swim. And if they could, you know, they couldn't do it as well as the Africans did stolen. There is a lake here, and I often wonder why I feel as if I'm drowning every time I look out into it. This and feeling incredibly small. And I often hear this joke about Black people not being able to swim or being scared of water. But my back rejects old swimming lesson memory for fighting for dear life even in the shallow end. And my lungs are too familiar with being breathless. And my therapist tells me that an exaggerated reaction to a small scare is a trauma response. But, but why am I scared? What trauma? The original terror answers like ripples like salt ocean waves. I heard a Jim Crow North and Ku Klux South kept colors out of public swimming pools and off public water fountains. I heard come hell or high water day, we're gonna watch niggas drown in a hurricane down South. But tell me, how do a nigga keep their head above water if niggas can't swim? Maynard was close by. He thrashed in the current, yelled, and disappeared under, only to reappear again seconds later, half yelling, treading, thrashing. Every time our skin goes under, it's as if the reefs remember that they were once chains, and the water wishes it could spew all the slaves and ships back onto shore. They mock us for not being able to throw ourselves into something that was so instrumental in trying to execute our extinction. There is a lake here I press my ear to, and I hear the sound of the woman who used to live inside of it. The struggle of screams. But they try to tell me it was the sound of the water. But there I was, my own life dangling over the black pit trying to save another. I had on many occasions tried to teach a man on how to swim, but I can now say that slavery murdered him. I had always been his protection like Yamaya. African goddess of water's first gift to human was a seashell in which her voice could always be heard. A reminder that where the slave ships, fire hoses, levees, tears, black bodies have always known rebirth when it comes to water. So for you, the water is for the boats and in the tans and all the cool stuff you do down there in your bathing suits. But we, we have come to baptize here. We have come to cleanse ourselves here. We have come to connect the living to the dead here. All respect for water is what you have termed as fear, but for the spiritual among us, I can now see why there is so much belief in this water. Swimming on my surfboard, I understand why so many seek salvation here. Why so many believe that there is God in this sea. But my problem, my problem isn't that I don't remember how to swim. It's that my body remembers too much from before. It remembers that with, that with every gasp, I am still breaking curses. <gasps> I felt my limbs submit as I went under. There was no straining for breath, no, no burning agony. And even as I tell you this now, I feel myself floating into something else. And no, the water is not that which comes from a storm. And no, this is not that which kills us, but there is peace in that blue light. More peace than sleep itself and more than that. There was freedom. And I now know that the elders had not lied. 
when they said that there was a home place of our own, a life beyond where there are children swimming, splashing in the water as the rock as the droplets ricochet between them. No, the droplets do not hurt. They simply roll down the side of the boy's cheek and no, this water is not that which comes from a storm. He is laughing. I learned how to swim, how to save a legacy of drowning, how to not let a natural thing hold me, and how I could exist with little effort. What a moving performance. Our next performer is Louise Nguam. Louise is a freshman from Jackson, Ohio, studying political science and philosophy. Louise is a member of the Honors College and a member of the Black Honors Student Organization. She will be performing a collection of poetry focused on the silencing of Black women's trauma. Please give a warm welcome to Louise Nguam. Black woman steps up to the mic. Black woman can feel the poem gestating from deep within her belly and the oxygen seems loud from her voice, but black woman cannot push the poem from her lips for fear that the crowd would call her poem ugly. It's cries of worry of being heard or, or even worse, they will try to kill it. On August 15th of 1999 at 11.55 p.m., while struggling with the reality of being a human instead of a myth, the strong black woman passed away. Medical sources said she died of natural causes, but those who know her know she died from being silent. Forgive me, doctor, for I have sinned. When I asked you to listen last, you offered me the blistered eardrum of some forgotten prophet, called yourself God and told me to lower my voice because you might not hear the truth. You said I spoke too loud for you to listen, and maybe you're right. Maybe I should just take all this black and stuff it back down my throat, make it easier for you to hear, easier for you to stomach. But even then, you would never even hear the half of it, not all at once. She is tired of being the strong black woman. She realized she can no longer be your superwoman, your superhuman, your extraordinary, your greatest of all time. Her black girl magic did not wake up like this. Me Too founder Tarana Burke told NPR on September 21st of 2021 that black women's trauma has a history of being ignored a fact of which Simone Biles was well aware of when she told First in Penn, as the only survivor of Nassar's abuse still competing, she felt that if she didn't remain active in the sport, the issue and her story, along with countless of other Black women's, would be brushed aside. Our culture's disregard for Black women's trauma stems from the fantasy of the superhuman, strong Black woman. Essentially, what faced Simone Biles was the perfect storm of misogynoir and myths, creating perceptions, creating stereotypes, creating expectations that all came crashing down on her. Simone's story reminds us that we don't afford the opportunity for Black women to be infallible human beings. Through the poetry, Forgive Me Doctor by Duacella. She is tired of being the strong Black woman by Lady Mataka. The strong Black woman is dead by Shamika Thomas. Black Woman Steps Up to the Mic by Icon, Black Girl Magic by Lamont Lilly, and Choose Your Fighter by Jane Shell. A program. Black women are not protected from their abusers or our expectations. I left school unprepared to wrestle with a world that would gladly stop me out with half a chance. A world that would pull my hair, steal my lunchable, and tell the principal I started it. A world that convinced me I was never good enough or I was never working hard enough. And black woman steps up to the mic, prays that she gets it right, realizes that her voice is made the only darkness in a sea full of white. She prays telling her own story will be stronger than the men who try to do it for her. She is tired. She's burnt out. 
She's tired of structural racism, burdens of generations of high blood pressure are literally killing her, having to be strong for everyone and everything is exhausting her. Some days she can't sleep, some nights she can't dream. Why does she always have to be so strong? Why can't she practice being soft? I can hear the voices that go off the chamber of the hollow oak tree. Their history is gutted out, their bodies now a casket from my half grown consciousness. Oh, doctor, I feel as though you're the type that likes to keep black bodies contained. You like to muffle our screaming, muffle our history. The last time I confessed to you, you thanked me for bearing such familiar fruit. You know, the kind that always dangled off a branch too high for me to reach. On my worst days, I believed the world when it told me I was not strong enough. White supremacy is the most conniving bully, and every day a black woman wakes up, she is tired. She's burnt out. She's tired of structural racism. She is tired of giving away energy for free. She has to choose a fighter just to make it through. I thought to be a good fighter meant to be superhuman, as unbreakable as the women around me, the good fighters who never let their heart show, who made it through level after level, straight faced healing their own bruises, making it through with whatever life offered them. But eventually I'll know you'll jump and snap the branch in half, pick the best pieces off my body, fashion a chair out of my body after severing away my truth. You will then thank me for giving you a front row seat to my trauma. And every conversation and every confession after that moment, black woman steps up to the mic. My voice will become a shadow of your truth. My body melts into a solemn melted core of doubt. My truth stripped bare from my chest. Maybe I should stop performing. Maybe if I stop talking, the poison will ripen my memories, leave them thick enough for you to choke on, keep the doctors away for a moment, keep an audience away for a lifetime. Forgive me, doctor. I know the good fighters keep getting up no matter how tired they are. Like a good fighter can rip the final boss apart with their teeth and have the blood stained out of her clothes by morning, always laughing at the world's attempts to bring her down. But I am no longer on the playground and superhumans only exist in video games. Eventually they'll say the strong black woman is dead. Eventually you can find me a rotten orchard of dew a burned tinted harvest, a shallow gathering of shallow black seas. I'll be nurturing these malnourished roots for centuries to come. O doctor who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and in heaven. Give this black knight a daily piece of bread and forgive her for trespassing, for she forgives those who trespass her body and leave her not within temptation. Deliver her from evil and wash away the poison. Forgive me, doctor, for I always sin. I will never stop sinning. And I've seen the greatest fighters in my life break down, no matter how hard they tried not to. And I believed another lie. Black women steps up to the mic. Black women, I am tired for you. You deserve to be healed. You deserve places where you are centered and not concealed. You deserve to dance and laugh from your soul. You deserve to move through this world unapologetically bold because the strong black woman, she's dead. Or she's still alive and kicking. I know I'm still here. Absolutely incredible. If you are watching right now and you are moved by these student performances, please drop some green hearts in the comments. We are not done yet. Uh, up next is Anne Dominique Cruz. Anne is from Canton, Michigan. She is a junior and her major is international business. She is a member of Kappa Milia. Anne will be performing a prose interpretation by Teresa Melbach. The Dream Lords, a performance exploring the consequences of sy systematic injustice. Please welcome Anne Dominique Cruz.
We lived in a house that once seemed too big, then seemed too small. But the extra space just made me more aware of the absence of my husband. But my daughter, who once slept on the couch, now had a small bed in my room. She was a bright kid. She loved drawing and carefully ignored the fact that we bought our clothes from garage sales. It's more fun this way, she'd say. Now, I was lucky that she loved drawing. It was entertaining and cheap. I'm going to be an architect when I grow up, she'd tell me. Showing off her latest artwork. like her daddy wanted to do. Her father had drawn fanciful castles telling her tales about the people who lived inside and I still saw his cities in my dreams. Their turreted towers, twisting stairways and grinning gargoyles nested in my mind and that might have explained the high demand. Often my dreams were copied and sold to various clients. The US has long advertised the mythology of the American dream. If we work hard, we'll be successful. However, the Washington Post of January 14th, 2020 rejects this capitalistic romanticization, claiming that today, it is far too easy for the 1% to exploit the optimistic working class as they pursue this myth. As a result, while the US has the reputation of making dreams come true, they neglect the health, well being, and livelihood of their working class. In this fictional world where even dreams become work, we are forced to acknowledge its parallels with the twisted pursuit of the American dream. The Dream Lords by Teresa Milbrot. I entered the dreaming industry easily enough. I was chatting with the wife of one of the dream lords. She was a regular at the salon where I worked and she loved the delicate little polka dots and flowers and other patterns I painted on her nails. And she told me, oh, it's easy money, dear. All you do is go to work and go to sleep. But like anything that anyone claims is easy. It was the hardest job of my life. The problem was, I was good at it, an effective and prolific dreamer, and sometimes I dreamed I was being chased by furries, monsters, <laughs> with the heads of women and bodies of huge black birds, and the castle was my refuge. Now I wanted to send my daughter to an art school where she could focus on her art, but that was part of the Dream Lord's business plan find employees when they're young and bring their brains dry of color. But I made a good wage, like a really good wage. And the working conditions were nice. The rooms had 20 beds, all which smelled of lavender and the dream lords hired gourmet chefs to prepare all of our meals. But it was one of the tiny perks to maintain the illusion that our bosses cared. Now, dream sleep, however, was far from restful. The scanners would invade your head, recording full-length dreams as well as scraps of ideas and images, and I came home with buzzing headaches, my mind full of after images. Oh, the people and things from your dreams infiltrating your waking hours. But dreamers rarely left the profession. I mean, we need the paycheck. Weaning yourself off of those dream enhancement drugs was apparently awful. Anyone who'd been off of work for more than four days told you it was better to go in and dream half dead than try to cope without the drugs. So six months after I started dream work, I started having after images of my husband. You need to think about your vision, he said and your visions. Now I have, but I wasn't gonna quit my job. Now, since birth, I'd been legally blind without my glasses and my prescription was the sort that gave everyone else headaches, but 
Ever since I started dreaming, my world had grown hazier. Some sacrifices aren't worth it, he'd say, but he didn't have to worry about paying off the mortgage or utilities or buying food. At least not anymore. Now the dream lords, they wanted bad dreams as well as good ones. And our bosses explained that some people had nightmare fetishes, but either way. My most prominent nightmare was my husband getting crushed under wooden beams at a construction site. I always thought I could save him if I just got there soon enough so I'd wake up panting. And my husband would be beside me in bed and he'd say, oh, the bad one again, as he tucked a piece of hair behind my ear. I couldn't feel him, but that didn't stop him from holding me. But other times, most times when I woke up, I'd wake up alone. It took forever to find real sleep again. And I knew I looked terrible. I came home to gargoyles, ransacking my kitchen, and I just wanted the impossible. For my husband to have never drawn gargoyles or to have died in the first place. But I couldn't do anything about either situation. So I resorted to slamming drawers and cupboards while I'd made mac and cheese. And my husband tried stopping me saying, you should quit if you want to. But if I quit, we'd lose our second hand shirts. To which he replied, would you rather lose that or your mind? My husband paused before continuing. I don't want you to keep dreaming. She'll lose you too. My hazy pictured a daughter glanced from him to me. My filmy turned to ghost right before my eyes. I suppose it's time to get back to work. I imagine the Dream Lord's wife in her cavernous house. I imagine an intersection, her car skidding to a stop, her mouth opening to scream. I imagine the next scene. The steel office building with smoke curling from the windows. The Dream Lord's wife is running down the street while the Dream Lord himself is stuck on the 10th floor. There's nothing heavy enough in his office to break the glass. His eyes burned, her eyes burned. I opened my eyes to the gray bedroom. I imagine the Dream Lord's wife waking up with smoke still filling her lungs. And as I lay back down to sleep, I imagined my husband mumbling to himself how there's something very wrong in all of this. There are benefits to losing your sight and your mind at the same time. Sight was less reliable, but I started to care less about that, as everything in my dreams I view might as well be what's in reality. I'm dead, my husband said. You know I'm dead. But the gargoyles were playing in their coffee canister waiting for the next tragedy to befall the town. So I told him, you're not dead in my dreams. And Dominique Cruz. Let's give another virtual round of applause for Anne and our other student performers down in the comments. Drop those green hearts. We are not done yet. Not only do we have talented students, but we also have talented faculty. And our next performance is one that is dear to me, my friend, my mentor, and a second mom, Dr. Doris Fields, our assistant vice president of academic programs and initiatives and professors of communication, performing Still I Rise by Dr. Maya Angelou. 
you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trot on me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like the moons and the sun with the certainty of ties, just like the hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken? <laughs> Bow down, slugs eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my hauntingness offend you? Oh, don't take it kind of hard. Cause I laugh like I got gold mines digging in my backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds meet me at my thighs? Out of the huts of history shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Absolutely amazing. Let's bring back all our performers and give them a virtual hand clap in the comments. What a wonderful group of performances. Our EMU forensics team and Dr. Doris Fields, thank them again in the comments. As we close out, I would like to encourage our campus community to take some time over the weekend, reflect, listen, learn, and acknowledge the history, the sacrifice, and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King. We can all celebrate and learn something from his historic impact on our society. Join us as we explore that impact through programming that includes academic programs, close-up performances, and the broadcast of our keynote address featuring our speaker, Justin Hansford, Howard University School of Law professor and executive director of the Third Good Marshall Civil Rights Center on Monday, January 17th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Again, thank you for joining us as we celebrate and rise together for justice. Thank you, everyone.